Despite the mathematical superiority of passive investing and the welter of empirical evidence supporting it, the industry has always tried to discredit it. When Vanguard introduced its first index fund in 1976, the idea was slated. And Mr. Johnson, the head of Fidelity, said, I can't imagine our shareholders would ever settle for average results. They expect to be superior. Famous poster came out in Wall Street. Stamp out index funds. They're un-American. And there was Uncle Sam with a cancel stamp. Bam, 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 bam. Canceling all the stock certificates. Among the many kind of claims, you can imagine all this. Uh, you wouldn't settle for an average brain surgeon if you needed brain surgery. Uh, so why would you settle for an average manager? As if there's any relevance to those two very different things. It was Bogle who had the last laugh. Vanguard now has more assets under management than any other company in the world, including Fidelity, which, incidentally, is now the second biggest provider of index funds. And yet, even in the United States, where Passive has a bigger market share than in the UK, Active remains by far the most popular way to invest. I laugh because, you know, I've been telling the same story for 52 years now. <laughs> We've gone from zero passive investing up to about 20 or 30 percent in the U.S. market, so it's very slow. <laughs> Penetration is, is, is very slow. So what, what I like to remind people, though, is that active management is a zero-sum game before costs. The whole cost argument uh, from an investment perspective is actually counterintuitive. You know, if you think about your life in other areas, so if you're out buying a car and, you know, you can buy a Rolls Royce and pay, you know, whatever Rolls Royces are going for today, or you can buy uh, an inexpensive Hyundai, you're going to feel a difference in the car. Now, whether it's worth that, you know, that huge price differential to you, only you as a, as a buyer can uh, make that decision. But you're, you're definitely going to feel there's a difference in quality in terms of durability and so forth. In investing, that's that doesn't that equation does not hold, and so when you think about the average investor who is also a consumer, and you know they're used to the the more I pay, the higher the quality, typically the better the results I get. Um, you come to investing, and it's just the opposite. And you know I think that's a really hard behavior uh, for people to unlearn. Perhaps surprisingly, another long-standing advocate of passive investing is the most famous active investor of all. Warren Buffett once said, when the dumb investor realises how dumb he is and buys an index fund, he becomes smarter than the smartest investors. More recently, Buffett gave this instruction to the trustee of his estate. Put 10% of the cash in short-term government bonds and 90% in a very low-cost index fund. The long-term results from this policy will be superior to those attained by most investors, whether pension funds, institutions or individuals, who employ high-fee managers. Warren Buffett is sort of a contradiction here, and so people take what they want to hear from Buffett. And the contradiction is this. Clearly, Buffett believes the efficient market hypothesis isn't correct, and he himself has said, if, if it was true, I wouldn't be here, and people like me and Charlie Munger would not get the great results. On the other hand, Buffett has told people in advice in his 1996 shareholder letter, if you invest in an index fund, you're virtually guaranteed to outperform the vast majority of investors, both institutional and individual. Virtually guaranteed. Now, it's only virtually guaranteed because he doesn't know if you're going to be able to stay the course. If he knew you'd stay the course, which is the second part of it, he would, rec he would say it is guaranteed. It's simple math. Passive investors must outperform active investors in aggregate because they have less costs. If you look in the mirror and see Warren Buffett or maybe Charlie Munger or Peter Lynch, go ahead and invest and try to pick stocks and beat the market. The rest of the world looking in the mirror doesn't see such a sight and then I would suggest you should follow Buffett's advice and you should invest in index funds or other passively managed funds. In recent years, even the great Warren Buffett has failed to beat index funds after costs. It's little wonder then that increasingly fund managers themselves are starting to acknowledge that this really is a loser's game. I think I realised it years ago when I was a full-time active investment manager. 
there were times when we, we could beat the index, we, we made the right calls and that was very satisfying, but it was extremely difficult to sustain it year after year. And the more research I did into it, the more I realized there were very few people who were able to sustain our performance sufficiently to cover all the extra costs of active investing. So I gradually came to the view that a fund should have rather more in index tracking than was then common. In those days, I think I favored some sort of mixture more recently, the more I've looked at the build-up of numbers, the more I think it is it's very difficult to find those star managers who are going to win. And there's always the danger that they had a very good strategy that works for two, three, five years. You then buy in because you're persuaded, and that may be just the point where that strategy starts to go wrong through no particular fault of their own. Fashions come and go, and quite a lot of so-called stellar management performance is just being on the right particular a theme at a time when that's popular in the market. So the fund management industry won't tell you this, it has far too much to lose by doing so. But the most appropriate investment vehicle for the vast majority of investors is the humble index fund. No, it's not perfect, we'll explain why later. And although it's a relatively simple way to invest, requiring very little maintenance, there are still some very important decisions for index fund investors to make. There is really no such thing as passive investing because you have to choose where the money is going to go. Somebody has to choose if the money is going to be in Japan or South America or, you know, emerging market bonds or Russia or whatever it is. Those decisions have to be made. Those are active decisions. Then once you've made those decisions, you're choosing the ETF or you're choosing the tracker, whatever it is. And in doing that, you're choosing a strategy. But there is another much bigger issue that needs to be addressed. As we've heard, passive investing is still far less popular than active. But what if that changed? What if passive continues to grow? And eventually, most people decided to invest passively. Here is how the perfect world of the, the Chicago efficient markets theory of finance works. We all get religion and we all just index. And then one guy thinks, oh, you know what? The new iPhone is great. I'd like to buy Apple. Apple's only, say, $500 a share. It's worth $1,000. i am going to buy some Apple. So he says, hey guys, I'll buy your Apple. I want six, I'll want i offer you $600 a share. And we say, we're just indexers. We're not going to alter our market weights. You must know something we don't know. So we're, we're going to hold Apple in its market weights. But things. Says, oh gosh. How about $700? We're just indexers. And then finally, he bids the price up to the $1,000 a share. So the ideal world, this isn't the real world. The ideal world, if we all indexed, we would never lose to the active managers because we would never sell and they would just bid the prices up so prices reflect information. You can see the hole in the story. The active manager should go drive a cab. He's not earning any money. Our world is one in which active managers do trade, and they trade and make money, and they bring the information in. The big puzzle is, who trades against them? Why don't we defend, those of us who don't know anything, why don't we defend ourselves just by indexing? So we've explained how the academic evidence points overwhelmingly to indexing being the best way for the vast majority of people to invest. Index funds should form the biggest part of every portfolio. We've already mentioned the importance of asset allocation, deciding how much to invest in equities or bonds, for example. Another key decision is what type or types of index fund to go for. The traditional and still the most common type is the cap-weighted or market-value-weighted fund. One drawback with cap-weighted funds is that as the price of a stock goes up, so does its weighting. That can sometimes leave you overweighted in a relatively small number of stocks. Go back to 1999-2000, the technology bubble. You know, you suddenly had six or seven or eight percent of a portfolio in Cisco, and the next thing, it's it's bombed out. So the question then is, is there a better way of constructing a portfolio, a better way of constructing, if you like, an index? And some experiments in the past, and I've been going on for 10 years, um, have suggested there are better ways. I'll give you a really simple example. Instead of um, weighting by the market capitalization of each stock, how about weighting by, well, make it equal weighted. So you've got 100 stocks in the FTSE, put 1% in each. So that's the sort of thing that starts us researching, looking at the top 1,000 US stocks and asking our simple rules like that. We call them heuristics. Are they capable of forming portfolios that actually do better over time than, say, buying the S&P 500 or the FTSE 100? 
You'll remember we looked at different types of risk, or beta, often known as factors. Certain types of stocks are more volatile, but do offer higher returns in the long run. It's now possible to buy an index fund comprised entirely of small company or value stocks, for example, to complement conventional index funds. They're more expensive than cap-weighted funds, but still far cheaper than actively managed funds. This sort of strategy is usually referred to as smart beta, though others call it alternative beta, fundamental indexing, factor investing or tilting. Whatever name you prefer to call it, it's becoming increasingly popular. The overall cap weight market portfolio, including everything, not just stocks, is always a legitimate portfolio in any asset pricing model. It's always one of the so-called efficient uh, portfolios. But if you take, for example, our work seriously, what it says is there are multiple dimensions of risk, and you can tilt towards these dimensions, so you can move away from the market portfolio towards these dimensions, depending on your taste for bearing different uh, sources of, of risk. There isn't one strategy that's optimal or efficient in the sense as a whole spectrum. A staunch proponent of this approach is Yves Schuferty, who runs Tobam, an asset management company based in Paris. For him, it's all about diversification. Ideally, the investor should be exposed to all the different risk factors. In order to build a diversified portfolio, you will want to try your best to have your own risk evenly contributed by all the risk factors that are available in the universe. If every single source of risk, if every single risk factor evenly contributes to my own risk, by definition you will not be able to tell me that I am biased. And if you cannot say that I am biased, probably I will be able to say that I am diversified. Others are more sceptical about smart beta, or at least that particular label. I think the, the name is unfortunate in that it, it seems to suggest that it's, um, it's a smart outcome, when, when in fact um, smart is a requirement when it comes to, to smart beta as it's called. It's a factor bet, it's a rules based factor bet where somebody is choosing to index um, a, a part of the market or part of a, a broader market cap index. Now that, that in itself can be fine. Um, but I think it's important to understand that you're taking a very active decision at, at the start there to, to actively go after one factor of the market. I think it makes it more complicated for an investor because previously you had active and passive. It's taken us a long time to get across what passive is. And I still don't think many people understand what it is. Yeah, we believe that Smart Beta is another way of getting an extra one or two percent return per year. But to the average person on the street, I think it does confuse them and just means that there's more product for them to actually try to understand. I think Smart Beta is another industry label that has emerged out of the funds management community, possibly out of some marketing departments, cynically. The best question an investor can ask is where do returns come from? And really no one has studied this more deeply than the academic community. And so when it comes to investment capital, it makes so much sense to do with that capital only that which has been proven. And that's where dimensions of return become so powerful because they've survived peer review, they've survived intense scrutiny. Complicated or not, is smart beta an option worth exploring? Well, it might be, depending on the level of risk you're willing to take. One touchstone to remember, the average investor has to hold the market portfolio. If you decide you're going to buy value, somebody else has to hold less value. If you're going to buy Microsoft, somebody else has to hold less Microsoft. The average portfolio has to add up to the market. And anybody who outperforms the market, somebody else has to underperform the market. We need a better theory of why we should do anything but just hold the market index. I do think there is one. Uh, and that is, if you view these as alternative dimensions of risk, and that what we're doing in asset markets is basically writing insurance to each other. Look at the stocks. Are you really the kind of investor who can bear that kind of risk? Uh, and what you are doing is you're writing insurance to other investors who don't want to bear that kind of risk. What is the risk? Why are some people not willing to bear that risk? Why can't I bear that risk? Is a good place to start thinking about what are these alternative betas you want to invest in.
Before moving on, let's briefly summarise. Mathematically, after costs, the average returns of a passive investor have to exceed the average returns of an active investor. The market cap-weighted index reflects the consensus view of the market and therefore is the ideal starting point for a passive investor. But the cap-weighted index isn't perfect and, depending on how much risk they're prepared to take, investors may want to tilt their portfolios towards other types of risk or beta, such as small company or value stocks. Beta, as we've said, is a measure of overall market risk. But what about alpha? That's the name we give to any return delivered by a fund or an individual security over and above the benchmark index. First and foremost, you should be indexing. Alternatively, you could tilt your portfolio towards different types of risk. But is there ever a case for chasing alpha, either by picking the stocks yourself or by using an active fund manager? That's a, that's a great question. Well, what I know is the average investor who does invest in an active fund has to expect to lose relative to a passive strategy. Why do I say that? What I know is if one active investor chooses to overweight some stock, then at least one other active investor has to underweight that stock. One might win by overweighting. If he wins, he loses by underweighting. So it's a zero-sum game before we start thinking about costs. And what I expect, what we see over and over again, is that active trading costs money and active managers charge a lot for their services. Now notice, one of them might have been brilliant, but the extent that one of them is brilliant, the person on the other side must be whatever the negative of brilliant is here, minus brilliant. I take a dim view of active management. For any investor to invest, you have to understand why the person you're giving your money to is in the half that's going to make money, not the half that's going to lose money. What's special about him? What's special about you that you know how to evaluate him? Somebody has to have some skill. There's evidence on how much skill is there out there, how many good managers are there, how many bad managers are there, and it's really depressing. If you don't know what you're doing, don't step into the casino. So let's be clear about this. All the evidence is stacked against active fund management. But say, for example, in spite of everything our experts have said, you still want to take a gamble with part of your portfolio. How do you choose an active fund from the thousands of funds available? Well, certainly not just by looking at past performance. A consumer would need to do a number of things. Firstly, they can just uh, offset the decision making altogether and go to an independent financial advisor and many do and they will select funds for them and that may be a mix of active and passive funds and that's a perfectly sensible thing to do but they may also if they wish to make decisions for themselves they may wish to look not only at managers track record but to actually read about what they say about themselves their, their, their style of choosing stocks and to read what people say in the media about them and what other analysts are saying. So I think there will be a number of factors in making a decision and it certainly shouldn't just be past performance on its own. What they want to look for are um, generally broadly diversified portfolios. Um, they want to look at the portfolio uh, manager and the, and the company behind that manager and make sure that they're long tenured, that they've had a consistent process and a consistent philosophy. You don't want people who change their stripes every couple of years or every mar market cycle. But the other thing you want to look at is um, what price you're paying. Um, Morningstar did um, some really groundbreaking work a couple of years ago where they found the best predictor of future performance is actually cost. So if you get the right manager with a long-term philosophy and a consistent philosophy and you have a low price portfolio, your chances of actually performing um, as well or better than the index uh, go up. An example of a fund management company that does take a long-term view and which keeps costs down by trading less is Edinburgh-based Saracen Fund Managers. I think in the old days, everyone tried to take a, a long-term approach, but it feels with the advent of hedge funds, uh, quarterly numbers, that a lot of the, the fund management industry has been getting caught up in the, the short-term noise and volatility caused by quarterly results uh, and news flow. Uh, we try and strip that out and actually take a long-term view. What we do here is we forecast out five years uh, which is much longer term than the market does to try and take advantage of 
to identify opportunities. Statistically, small funds like those run by Saracen tend to perform better than very large ones. And their managers are more likely to invest their own money in them, which is always a good sign. Many of the large firms, the managers aren't aligned with their investors because they're paid by uh, bonuses from performance, not for how well the, f the fund does directly. You know, and one thing that, uh, that Warren Buffett certainly has is a huge amount of his own personal savings involved with his fund. And an investor should, should be always consider is the fund manager aligned with them as, as much as they should be. Also, remember the benefit of having exposure to different factors of risk. Value investing is particularly worth investigating, as are the writings of the man usually credited with founding it, the British-born American academic and professional investor Benjamin Graham. For an insight into Graham's investment philosophy, we visited the university where he studied and taught, Columbia in New York City. You're looking for cheap, ugly, disappointing, obscure, and otherwise orphaned stocks. Portfolios formed on those bases significantly outperform portfolios of glamour stocks. And I think there are three fundamental human characteristics that account for the persistent outperformance of those portfolios. The first is that people will systematically overpay for the dream of getting rich. And that's why these glamour stocks get overvalued. And remember, the average return has to be the average return on all stocks. People who specialize in the glamour stocks are going to underperform the market. And so staying away from them will benefit you. Second thing is people don't like to look closely at ugly. The behavioral finance name for this is loss aversion. And you look at these portfolios of cheap stocks, two thirds of them may go bankrupt. But the ones that don't do so well that the portfolios of these stocks substantially outperform the market. The third thing that I think cements the first two effects are human beings are not good at dealing with uncertainty. And therefore, when they think about situations, they try and assume the uncertainty away and are overconfident. Like Bichelier, Samuelson, Sharp and Farmer, Graham's aim was to take the guesswork out of picking stocks. He famously inspired one of his pupils, Warren Buffett. And Buffett's subsequent success is testimony to the validity of Graham's approach. Warren Buffett has described Benjamin Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor, as by far the best book about investing ever written. In it, Graham wrote that investment is most intelligent when it is most businesslike. In his preface to the fourth edition of the book, Buffett said, the sillier the market's behavior, the greater the opportunity for the businesslike investor. Follow Graham and you'll profit from folly rather than participate in it. brings us to another important aspect of successful investing. Whichever route you choose to go down, whether it's passive, active or somewhere in between, your behaviour is absolutely critical, especially at times that emotions are running high. One of the big difficulties is getting people to stay the course when results are disappointing. It should come as no surprise to people that markets go up and they go down. When they go down, there's a tendency to people go, gosh, are we on the edge of an abyss? You know, will things really get bad from here? And they, like in 2008, 2009, it was difficult to get people to stay the course. And my heart goes out to these people that were invested in equities, lost half their money, then got out and missed the rebound. It may take quite a while for them ever to get back even again. Everyone knows the idea is to buy low and sell high, but time and again, we do the precise opposite. This chart shows how much money US investors have put into and taken out of equity funds since the late 1990s. The graph peaks in January 2000. In other words, investors were piling in just as the market reached the top. Then, even worse, they bailed out just as prices reached the bottom and were about to rise again. That kind of behaviour is sadly all too typical, and even the professionals are prone to it. The effect on the long-term value of our investments can be catastrophic. 
So how do we as investors curb that sort of self-destructive behaviour? Well, one way is to have an automated approach to investing. So you choose your strategy and the level of risk you're prepared to take, and then you leave your investments exactly as they are. Either once or at the most twice a year, you rebalance your portfolio to realign it with your tolerance of risk. But again, that can be done automatically. There are lots of styles that work over the long term, that you know, value works, dividend investing works, momentum investing works if you get it right. All sorts of things work, but they only work if you stick with them. And one of the problems that active fund managers have is it's very, very difficult for them to stick with any kind of style because they get buffeted around by opinion, by different methods of valuation, by markets, by what people say to them in the pub, by what their colleagues are doing, etc. It's very hard for them to stick to a strategy. You know, when I see fund managers, and I see a lot of fund managers, they pretty much all tell me the same thing. They have a strategy, they outline their strategy. It's very often quality or value or income based. They have back tested it, they show me their back testing. It looks great. They go away and you think, well, if they do that, that'll work out very well. Uh, but they never do it. Or if they do do it, they do it for six months or eight months and then they're distracted by something, the strategy changes and their performance suffers as a result. But what fundamental indices do or indices that are based on any one particular factor is they force consistency. You have to choose a style and then the computer makes you stick to that style and that's why it works. It also helps to have a financial advisor to keep you on track. But not just any advisor. Far too many advisors believe, wrongly, that their primary role is to pick the right funds and to persuade their clients to switch to a different fund when, inevitably, their original recommendation underperforms. There are two great roles for an, an advisor. One is to help individuals understand themselves and what their real financial purposes are and what their anxieties would be in anticipation so they can lay out a really sensible long-term investment program. That's one. And the second is to hold hands and encourage staying the long, long, long-term, because the long-term can be very, very positive if we only have the ability to stay with it through the thick and the thin, through the exciting positives, through the terrifying negatives that cause most of us to make mistakes. Why in the name of peace do we pay any attention to the stock market? The stock market is a derivative. The stock market is the derivative of what? It is the derivative of the, the earning power and dividend yields on, in, 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 in the case of this nation, of U.S. corporations. The dividend yield plus the earnings growth that follows is what creates the fundamental return on stocks. And, uh, the speculative return on stocks uh, compared to that investment return is how much people are willing to pay for a dollar of earnings and that carries the market up and down and in the long run in the last hundred years the contribution of speculative return to total market return is zero and the contribution of, of uh, investment return happen to have four and a half percent dividend yield four and a half percent earnings growth that's the 9% you read about at the past of the U.S. market. The stock market is a giant distraction to the business of investing. Of course, it doesn't help that we're constantly hearing about the markets. There are specialist magazines. Almost every major newspaper has a money section. There are radio shows and, of course, entire television channels devoted to the latest on the markets and where the so-called experts think they're heading. When it comes to invest returns, the media is definitely a bad influence on the retail investor. What the media does is encourage activity. It encourages people to buy and sell. Um, invariably, it's not just the unnecessary costs involved in a lot of buying and selling. It leads to people making bad timing decisions. For their own benefit, I think investors should block out as much noise as possible. And that, in a nutshell, is the secret to winning the loser's game. First, choose a strategy that's based on evidence, preferably one designed to capture the returns of the whole market, and then tailor it to your attitude to risk. Secondly, stick to your chosen strategy through thick and thin. Yes, rebalance your portfolio, but most important of all, 
Stay the course. Our journey is almost done. We've explained how the odds are heavily stacked against the ordinary investor, and how by settling for an average return and refusing to pay a small fortune in charges, you can end up as one of the winners, saving yourself a great deal of time, effort and worry in the process. But there is a much bigger issue here. It's not just we as individuals who are losing out. The whole world faces a pensions crisis. We're living longer, and although most of us will also work longer, there'll be huge numbers of people retiring without enough funds to sustain them throughout their later lives. In deciding to dispense with active management for its local government pension scheme, the UK has joined a list of governments, including Australia, Norway and California, which have started to question the traditional way of doing things. Governments are realising that to the extent that pensioners have small pensions, they ultimately fall back on the state for assistance. So there is a very strong economic rationale to have pension funds perform better. The investing sector has become a key component of the global economy. Here in Scotland, for example, hundreds of fund managers, brokers, advisory firms and consultants have concentrated around Edinburgh, now Europe's fourth largest financial centre. Yes, the sector does make a significant contribution to economic wealth and tax revenues. But as we've seen, it also takes a great deal from ordinary investors through the charges it levies. So has the investment industry simply grown too big for our own good? The fund management industry needs huge reform, of course it does. There are way too many funds. Uh, there's way too much attempt to produce difference out of nothing and you know this is this is a huge problem in the financial industry if you want to sell things you need to differentiate yourself from the next guy along but in fact investing is remarkably simple i mean you know not, not necessarily easy but simple straightforward uh, it doesn't need so many different products it doesn't need so much differentiation it doesn't need quite so many people and it doesn't need to be so expensive i think the real problem is there's far too much expectations in this whole area. And this will be disappointing news for people in finance in a way, but really we've got too many people employed in it, doing too much, trading too much, for very small amounts of, of gain for the population as a whole, but of course a very large transfer of, of finance into the, the, the hands of the people doing it. The industry says it accepts that passive approaches to investing are likely to become more popular. But, not surprisingly, it doesn't like the idea of the active fund sector contracting. I don't fear for the future because I think active will maintain a very strong role in investment management as a whole. But I think that it would be detrimental to the operation of the market, to investment in uh, capital investment in corporate UK, if active were to become too marginalised. And I don't believe that that will happen. It's true that the market system needs active managers to function, but the academic consensus is that a global fund industry just 20% the size it currently is would be more than sufficient to maintain market efficiency. Many of our experts also believe that the huge financial rewards on offer to fund managers are counterproductive in that they incentivise very short-term outperformance when most people are, or at least should be, investing for the much longer term. In 2013, the average Wall Street bonus rose by 15%, bringing the overall industry total to a staggering 26.7% billion dollars. Remember, that's not salaries, that's just bonuses. The bonus system is absolutely ridiculous. Um, you know, the very idea that we should be paying people extra if they perform well, I always find absolutely infuriating on the basis that, you know, we are already paying them for them to do their best. If they do do their best, why should we have to pay them more? If there were fewer fund managers earning more modest pay packages, perhaps more of our brightest graduates would shun the city and pursue careers instead in sectors where they really can make a difference. As John Bogle likes to say, it's not the speculators or the markets that add value. Ultimately, it's successful businesses that drive investment returns. 
And despite the lazy way in which business and the markets are often lumped together by journalists and politicians, those are in fact two very different things. The function of the securities markets is to allow new capital to be directed to their highest and best use. That's true, but think about the math for a minute. We, we probably get, in the last couple of years, maybe $300 billion a year that goes to new offerings and additional IPOs and additional offerings. We trade 56, most recent number, $56 trillion. And that means something like 99.5% of what the stock market does, of, of, of what we do as investors, is trade with one another, and a half of 1% is directing capital to new business. There is a system that has failed society, period. So there's wide agreement that the investment industry needs to change. But where will change come from? I believe the industry realises a lot more than it's ever willing to fess up. Underneath the surface, the individuals in the city in general realise that they've had it too good for too long. Now, will change come from within? Pretty unlikely. The trade bodies, of which the IMA is one, are masters at doing just enough to keep the show on the road in terms of hinting at change and improvement for the consumer is around the corner. The IMA, the Investment Management Association, is a trade body that is there for its members. It is financed and supported by the members, which is the fund management industry and the banking industry. Is it doing a better job of protecting the investor and making things more transparent for an investor? Definitely not. Michael Johnson sees a key role for journalists and educators in bringing about change for the better. There's a strong campaign, for example, to increase education in schools, financial literacy. Maybe that's a starting point. And the media could usefully attune itself to the level of, uh, of technical understanding of the man in the street as an, in an explaining role, as well as in an inquisitive role, rather than simply reporting the stories that it's given by highly paid PR agents acting on behalf of very wealthy clients. Ultimately, though, it's up to us, ordinary investors, to demand a better deal. Yes, we do need to put more into our pensions and other long-term investments. But we also have to start questioning why the industry is taking so much out to start insisting on a fairer share of investment returns, especially as those returns in future are likely to be smaller than they have been in the past. We need to wise up to be more realistic. We have to be less gullible and, yes, perhaps a little less greedy as well. There are no magic shortcuts to successful investing, but over the last 120 years or so, we've learned so much about how it works that it's simply not necessary anymore to pay expensive experts to gamble with our money. Together, we will win this game in the end. There's this great quote from Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations that says there's one principle that is so simple and so universal we don't even need to defend it, and that is the ultimate object of all business should be to serve the consumer. Mm -hmm.